Buju, Wago Shindagu, Migazi, and Do Dame Gazagasquaji Mekag, Indun Jaba. Today I'd like to share a perspective about the construction of pipelines for the transportation of fossil fuels. This has been a hot button topic in indigenous communities and throughout the country for a variety of reasons. First of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that as long as we are buying gas to power our vehicles and heat our homes, someone is gonna figure out how to get that product out of the ground and get it to market. The bottom line for fighting pipelines has to be reducing our dependency on fossil fuels. And this fight will not go away until we have successfully done that. I do think that some of the new technologies available for generation of electricity, solar, wind, um, for powering vehicles with battery powered and electric vehicles, I think really improves our chances of doing that. There are, a, there's a big array of interests aligned to prevent that from happening, including all of the entrenched corporations uh, that benefit from keeping us dependent on fossil fuels to run our lives. That has to be the number one priority for a long-term solution. Having said that, I think when you look at the different means that there are to get that product out of the ground and get it to the market, none are environmentally friendly and none have no risk. Really, do you want it on a truck, in a train, or in a pipeline? All of them pose environmental risks and other risks. When it comes down to it, if the companies that ran pipelines looked at a place where the product came out of the ground and the place that they wanted to get it and drew the most environmentally responsible route to get it from point A to point B, I think we'd have a really different story. But typically they do not pick the most environmentally responsible route. For example, in Northern Minnesota where I live, pipelines will often crisscross the Mississippi River multiple times, the same pipeline, because the Mississippi River, you know, squiggles around across northern Minnesota and then south. And so they'll cross that thing in a straight line with, with thought given to the most financially expeditious route for the company, not the most environmentally sensitive route when they cross the longest river in the United States of America. I think if the company drew the most environmentally sensitive route and then operated with great respect for tribes and tribal people, um, various other human population centers and things like that, and then drew a route that was respectful for the environment and respectful to tribes, and did their due diligence with tribes and other entities and had their full support, this wouldn't even be an issue. You wouldn't be able to please 100% of the people 100% of the time, but this would not be the contentious issue that it is. Unfortunately, the companies that build pipelines are privately owned entities whose first priority is not the environment and is not Native Americans. Their first priority are their shareholders. And they have to make decisions that increase shareholder value and subordinate other things to that effort. Also, because they're companies and they have to give quarterly reports on earnings and so forth. Also, because corporations have to be responsive to the short-term vicissitudes of the stock market and demand for improving shareholder value on the short term, 
they make decisions that provide the best short-term financial benefit, even if there are other decisions that would be better for them economically in the long term, such as taking the time to do it right by the environment and by tribes so they had an alignment of interest and support of their corporate endeavors, they don't do that. They go for the short-term win at the expense of long-term relationship building. And the results are pretty obvious. Not all corporations are made the same. So energy transfer partners, which operated and continues to operate the Dakota Access Pipeline is run uh, by a different entity than Line 3 and Line 5, which crisscross you know, much of the Great Lakes region. And uh, those are operated by Enbridge, a Canadian-owned entity uh, that has different management and different tactics. When building the Dakota Access Pipeline, Energy Transfer Partners made a number of willful violations of tribal sovereignty and basic human decency and good sound business practice. For starters, when citizens of the town of Bismarck, North Dakota complained that the pipeline would encroach upon or come near their community and they worried about the environmental and human costs, the company willingly rerouted the pipeline. When the tribal community at Standing Rock had the same exact complaints, then they were ignored and the company built the pipeline right up to the edge of the reservation and from the other edge of the reservation in another direction so that there was just this one little loop that was missing where the reservation was located and all of the remedies really were pretty poor put a big horseshoe shaped loop to avoid the reservation. It's still right on the border, right up on the only source of clean water available to the people who live there. It was already a situation in which the tribal constituents would not get the most important thing that they wanted, which was no risk to their water source. Energy Transfer Partners also engaged in a number of strong arm tactics. For example, the employment of a private security firm that used attack dogs and sick dogs on people who were engaged in peaceful protest, uh, which further inflamed the rest of the protest community and um, native nations who then rallied to support Standing Rock and also the protest community that was beginning to gather there. They exacerbated tensions, they avoided diplomacy, and they sought to roll over on the tribes and on tribal people. A number of their tactics also circumvented basic legal practice. So the state of North Dakota, for example, has a law protecting family farms that says corporations cannot own farms and ranches. And there was a private ranch adjacent to the reservation where some of the pipeline was going to cross. And that's where some of the protest community was camped out. Now, the company, Energy Transfer Partners, sought to purchase the ranch from this white couple so that they could then say that the protesters were trespassing on the company's private property. And officials for the state of North Dakota approved the sale in spite of the prohibition against corporations owning ranches and farms. Furthermore, once native people were camped out, some brought their families, children, then officials for the state of North Dakota sought to weaponize the Department of Education and Social Services in the state. They said, if kids are present, that means they're not in a school, and even if their parents have, you know, established a homeschool protocol for those kids, they're all truant. Send Social Services, initiate a CHIPS petition, standing for Children in Need of Protective Services, to remove those children from the home and place them in foster care. Messaging to parents, if you protest our pipeline, we'll take your kids. And I thought this was an especially egregious violation 
of the protocol. Like if children are endangered or neglected, that is when you initiate a CHIPS petition, not when you don't like the politics of their parents. And this pressure continued to grow and ramp up. In fact, there were even people from the press who were simply there with a camera to report on what was happening, who were charged with sedition and riot. Most of the press coverage that was focused on the Dakota Access Pipeline was very much opposed to the protest and the message of the protesters. Uh, I think a lot of times the media from all political persuasions tends to sensationalize things. And when I was at the Dakota Access Pipeline protest site, I saw signs that said, we are protectors, we are peaceful and prayerful, isms have no place here, we are nonviolent, respect locals, we are proud to stand, no masks, no weapons or what could be considered weapons, all campers must get an orientation. Direct action training is required for all taking action. No children in potentially dangerous situations. We keep each other accountable to these principles. This is a ceremony. Act accordingly. Property damage does not get us closer to our goal. And in spite of all of that, the press continued to focus on uh, a negative portrayal of what the protest was all about. The protest was about protecting the sovereignty of the Standing Rock, Dakota. It was about protecting the environment. And those messages were subordinated. By the way, the, the protesters killed zero people, but there was a military occupation, military occupation. And armored vehicles, a massive law enforcement and military presence, all in response to the protection of corporate interests at the expense of the environment and peaceful protesters. Ultimately, uh, as we think about not just what happened at Standing Rock, and eventually, of course, as the Trump administration replaced the Obama administration and they greenlit the pipeline, there was no way for the protesters to have any effect on delaying or denying the pipeline. Ultimately, with the ongoing issues regarding Line 3 and Line 5, there's a different company, Enbridge, which has made a point of trying not to exacerbate tensions with the use of attack dogs and private security firms, but they are still intent upon the most financially expeditious route for accomplishing their goals. And I think with the PR campaign that Enbridge is engaged in right now, it's a very disingenuous campaign. They say that they want to replace, for example, line three an old and corroding line with new pipes so that it is safer for the environment and for people. But what they are not saying is that they actually want to replace the existing pipeline with a much larger pipeline that will increase the daily flow of oil through that pipeline. And if there's a rupture, you will actually get a bigger spill than you would had they not done the replacement. That's disingenuous. And I would tell Enbridge, as a matter of good business practice, not to misrepresent what they're doing because people can smell the lie. I would advise them to pick the most environmentally responsible route and method to do right by the environment and do right by the tribes. And also furthermore, to embrace regulation by outside entities, 
one of the biggest issues right now with pipelines is that the pipeline companies regulate themselves. You can put a stop valve in a pipeline as often as you like, every quarter mile if you want, but it costs more money. So the companies put them when the lines cross the Canadian border and then every however many miles, 100 miles or so forth. And if there was an outside entity regulating that, we could actually have more of those along the line. So when there's a rupture, it doesn't rupture a 100 mile stretch of the pipeline. It actually ruptures a much smaller part and the environmental damage is much less. That would be good for the environment. That would help get regular citizens on board and support that corporation's enterprise. But because corporations like Enbridge think of their quarterly profit statement and that it will cost more money to do it that way. And because they are authorized to regulate themselves, they do not do that. I think, you know, it, as we think about how do we go forward from here, I would have a message to the protest community too, which is that if our protest is limited to standing in front of the bulldozer and saying, stop, we already lost 95% of that battle. They've already cleared so many regulatory hurdles. It's going to be so difficult to get a positive result. Not impossible, but more difficult. We have seen efficacy with protests. For example, in Minnesota, the Sandpiper pipeline received a very strong protest. The delays, every day of delay cost the company lots of money. And the delays added up to the point where they said, you know what, forget Sandpiper, we're gonna go another route. And another route is sizing up line three and having a bigger pipeline that can cover the traffic they were originally talking about doing with Sandpiper. Um, so protest can delay and delays cost money and it can get some leverage. But the other things that we really need to fight for, we need to fight for much earlier, more consistently and persistently. And they include external regulation of pipelines so that the companies don't have to regulate themselves because they won't. They will do the minimum required. Um, also, more truth required out of pipeline companies, disclosure statements, so that things like the fact that they want to size up line three to a bigger pipeline have to be disclosed the same way that a cigarette company has to disclose the health risks to what they're doing. Um, I think we should also be pushing for, you know, increased taxes on carbon and fossil fuels. We should be, you know, fighting to eliminate the use of plastic bags in grocery stores and doing everything in our power to diminish our reliance on fossil fuels. Also, a lot of the work has to happen in education. The companies are very effective at trying to cast the protest community as rabble rousers, outsiders, professional protesters, and diminish the main message that the protest world is trying to deliver. So I think we need to fight smarter, not just harder. And the bottom line for all of us is to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels so that there is no longer demand for this product because the product and all the means of getting it from point A to point B hurt the environment and the humans and diminish all of us. Thanks for watching today, miigwech. Thanks for watching today, I'm Anton Troyer. Let's keep in touch. I'm active on social media and my website has lots of information on my books, speaking engagements, free Ojibwe language resources, resources for teachers and more. Miigwech.